right, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event. Dr. Jeffrey Race has an AB, AM, and PhD in government from Harvard and began this project while an Ash Fellow of the Kennedy School. He has taught political science and economics and is the author of The War Comes to Long An, a highly original case study of human motivation in the Vietnam War, which Amazon lists as one of the top 10 military theory studies of all time. <coughs> In a parallel engineering career, Dr. Race is a life senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and in this talk brings to bear on the pathologies of public policy, making the insights of hard science. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. So, I thank you all for coming this afternoon, and uh, I think you'll hear some things you haven't heard other places, and you'll get two takeaways from this talk, at least. Uh, first is an unusual decision-making checklist, and second is an understanding of how to bring about changes in a new way, which I propose, because the situation essentially is uh, right now, my subject. So I hope to learn from your comments uh, after our talk, because I want to improve my work. This is, the book is in the process of writing. It's five enormous stacks of documents on my desk, which is longer than this one. And uh, it's gradually being converted into uh, text. So I, this subject can be examined at different levels of detail. So I'm going to quickly go through the basics, if you want more detail about things, and we're able to cover all of them abstract levels, we can go into more detail uh, later. And although I'm talking about public policy making, in fact, these rules which I developed, the filters, are equally applicable to decision making in your private lives or for commercial enterprises, for NGOs, any kind of organization. So why I'm here? Uh, let me take off my watch and make sure I'm getting the time right here. Uh, so 54 years ago, as I'll explain in a moment, I was puzzled that things were not quite going the way they were expected to go in Vietnam, where I was the most junior uh, second lieutenant. And I had uh, studied the, uh, I studied the problem, and I published an unusual book which answered that question. Here's the book, the second edition. And, um, you may need something very bad is happening here. Hannah, what's going on? Windows has defeated me again. Jeff, it's the aging process. Yeah. Windows is aging. This is Windows Rock. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so just don't touch anything yes. except the scroll. Okay, so that's the second edition of the book. It's been uh, it was published first in 1972. It, uh, Forty years later, it was published in a uh, second edition. It's still selling, although one of our visitors tonight says it's actually not on Amazon anymore, which strikes me as a little odd because it's actually publishing on demand now. Anyway, um, I wrote the book uh, and. Uh, but uh, and I didn't really think too much more about the problem originally, uh, you know, of a bad war, a war gone bad. Um, but then I noticed as the decades went by that the failed wars continued, which were the result of very bad decision making. And it interested me also that uh, there were very serious errors of decision making in other domains of public life, like economics. And so I thought, why and what to do about it. And so I've been thinking about this for 50 years. And what uh, the book uh, is essentially the result of 50 years of personal involvement. I lived this. 
uh, as you'll hear a little bit about, uh, this is not ivory tower research. All the, almost all the materials are available on my website. Uh, they're in bits and pieces, but they're all being pulled together into this book that I'm working on now. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do in this presentation. Uh, the, first, the question. Uh, why do highly intelligent leaders with degrees from the world's greatest universities, with equally intelligent and skilled staffs and limitless research budgets, continue to make catastrophic decisions, even though warned of the catastrophes ahead? So this is not a complaint. It's just a legitimate scientific question. So my method is to use case studies. It's something I've found very useful my whole life. And from the case studies, I collect ideas or lessons about what might have mitigated the bad outcome or prevented the bad outcome. And then I assemble these into filters uh, to apply uh, to present uh, decisions. Now, uh, I, and then I will explain how these decision-making filters dis differ from present-day pr programming decision-making. And I'll give examples of how their implementation would work differently from present practice. And next to last, I explain why these filters cannot be applied now. And then I explain at the end how they could be implemented. Uh, so you'll get two take-homes. Uh, one is you'll understand why we're in such a mess. And the second thing is you will understand some rules that you could apply to decision-making to uh, mitigate future messes. Okay. So... We'll do the first case study. Um, this is what kind of got me started on this thing 50 years ago. Uh, I had been in uh, ROTC, and the year I graduated from college, uh, they decided to have a war. So I, in September of 1965, I became the most junior second lieutenant in Vietnam through a funny uh, series of events having to do with my having graduated from Harvard. I wasn't supposed to go. But my colonel said, I changed the orders at uh, Mill Percent because I want a Harvard man in my battalion. Uh, so that's how I ended up in Vietnam. So we were 23 days on a ship. I studied Vietnamese on the, uh, got some tapes, studied Vietnamese before my arrival. And I was assigned to essentially a desk job at Saigon Airport managing a uh, radio transmitter site because I was in the signal quarters. My hobby in them was electronics. But even though I had a desk job, I sensed before long that things were not going right. Uh, something was wrong. But I didn't know exactly what was wrong. But I had quite good contacts because I from uh, college and people I met in college, and all the people I met who ought to know the answer why things were not going well, nobody had the answer of why that was. So uh, at the end of my first year, it was my option to return to the United States. I had only one year obligatory tour in a combat zone, but I worked a deal with the Army that if they would send me to a combat assignment, get away from Saigon, or I could get close to the field, I would extend for a year. And normally they wouldn't assign a Signal Corps officer to an infantry slot, but in my case I spoke Vietnamese, so they did the deal. And I had a wonderful assignment. There were only four other Americans. We were a little rural advisory team, uh, all Vietnamese uh, uh, forces that we were close to. And at the end of the second year, I had even more questions than at the end of the first year. So when I finished my two years of military service in Vietnam, I went back on my own money and essentially said, I cannot go on with my life until I understand what is wrong with this picture. And so I wrote a book, uh, which was also my dissertation. And I highly recommend writing your dissertation before you go to graduate school because it gets you through very fast. Uh, and it's still selling after 40 years. Okay, so what was the question that I asked in this book? Because in this discussion, I want to talk about Questions. So the question was, it was expected that with increasing American resources and involvement, uh, there would be greater security. But in fact, the more the American involvement, the worse the violence. So the scientific question is, how can the government, with a blank check from the United States, military, economic, diplomatic, political, lose influence over its people to a movement which has very poor resources and whose personnel wear shoes made from old tires? And that's a legitimate scientific question. For those of you who read War and Peace, it's the same question Tolstoy asked. Why do 600,000 men march out to war when Napoleon utters certain words? So President Ziem said, okay, my South Vietnamese troops march out to war, and they didn't. And Ho Chi Minh said, my troops march out to war, and they did. That's an interesting scientific question. 
And there's a simple answer, uh, which was not well known. Nobody knew it in political science, but all the sociologists knew it, but nobody ever asked any sociologists. And the American, particularly the American strategists, who were very smart, uh, never figured it out. So now we'll try the scroll mouse. I think maybe Hannah. Is Hannah here? Is anybody? I'm just scrolling like, oh, wait. Oh, I see. Oh, it goes the other way. You scroll down and it goes up. I see. Defeats the best money. So, she, just, she, she just has to walk into the room. Yeah. <laughs> okay, don't go away. Anybody recognize this person? Yes. <laughs> okay. So he was the dean of the faculty of arts and sciences when I arrived. He was one of the very smart people. Uh, I learned international relations at the foot of this gentleman in Government 180. And I never met this man, but he was another, another one of the very, very smart people who brought you that disaster. So this, this is, these are the people. Why do people like this do stupid things? Uh, okay, so it, anyway, the, the conclusion is it wasn't because of the lack of weapons. It wasn't because of the lack of economic aid. It wasn't because of uh, lack of diplomatic support that things went bad in Vietnam. It was because the people who planned that operation just didn't understand what was going on. And I'll explain to you in about 90 seconds what it was. It's very simple. The American doctrine followed a conventional thinking about security. Security comes from concentrating military or police forces in some place where there's a security threat, uh, and that will prevent incidents. But it's logically impossible if there's a security threat everywhere because you can't concentrate your forces everywhere. It's a logical impossibility. So essentially the American doctrine failed before it started. Uh, you need a different concept of security, which I call the sympathetic environment. And you get that by motivating people. And the universal motivators are wealth or income, uh, power, and status. They work in every society at every level. And if you use these motivators, you can develop what the sociologists call an emergent structure. Peter Blau is the expert on that. He wrote the definitive uh, uh, research studies on that. And then you can develop, the revolutionary movement can develop great power. If you don't know how to do that, you lose. And uh, so I won't get into the details there, but I will just say, here's one example. Yeah, so that's, that sort of summarizes that. So here's an example where the government um, apparatus, essentially the local power was by the elites, and there was a gap, and then for the higher levels of the administration, they recruited urban elites. There was, even if you started in some village level apparatus, you couldn't go up. But the revolutionary system worked differently. If you're a smart boy, but without much education, you can go all the way up through their system. You can achieve power and status in a way that you had no hope of doing in the government system. And the same thing, and so this is what I call a contingent incentive. If you continue playing with the revolutionary movement, you got these things. And it also applied, for example, in the case of land. The government had a land reform program. They would give you a title lead. Whether you cooperate with the government or not, you still had the title. Whereas with the communists, you would get the usufruct of the land, you could operate it, but you only had it as long as the revolutionary movement maintained power in that area. It's what I the term I developed called the contingent incentive. The government people, whether in Saigon or in Washington, they never understood this. They had no clue about these things. And I tried to discuss this with people, and it's what I call the blank areas of consciousness phenomenon. They just had no idea. Just I would try to talk to American officials about it. They just, you couldn't have a conversation. They had no idea. So the U.S. response from 1965, when we became involved, essentially was totally unrelated to the generative factors and the loss of the government influence in the country over the previous 10 years. The American answer was use violence. And as everybody knows, you use violence, particularly in a highly familial society, you make a lot of enemies. So the more violence, uh, the violence led to more violence, we went through a death spiral. Uh, and so, okay, so now, uh, so that's the Vietnam thing. It was a conceptual error at the start. Now let's think about Iraq. And 
uh, and in Afghanistan. Again, briefly. And here, uh, our reading today is this book called Anatomy of Victory, written by John Caldwell. And he asks a very interesting question. He asks the question, what accounts for the differing results of American efforts in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq? The results are very different. And the answer is no, if you look at the evidence. So he develops, um, you don't have to buy the book, by the way. You just go to Google and you go to page 431, because it's all on page 431. We almost do you think we is Hannah nearby? There you go. Right there. It's there we go. So that's the book, John <coughs> And that's on page four thirty one. So he says this is the conclusion. It's very comprehensive, it's very dense. But this is all you have to read in the whole book. You have to define a successful outcome, and then you plan backward. You define a strategy, a series of political military actions. You define the plans and you allocate the resources, and then you execute well. And it requires, for complicated things like Vietnam or Iraq, it requires something called a whole of government operation. That's the current buzzword. It's not profound. It's obvious. To reach that conclusion, you have to go through 400 pages of evidence. But the conclusions are valid because they're based on evidence. Uh, but this is not what our leaders did. Essentially, they have failed the American public for decades and decades and decades. So um, he look, we'll just look, for example, at Iraq. I made up a little table here. You know. It was actually five different wars. So the first three worked. And because they were conventional operations, using the concept of security, which I mentioned to you, which is part of American military doctrine. Uh, the fourth and fifth wars, to create a stable and friendly Iraqi government, uh, failed. And for a simple reason. There was no operationally clear end state. Operationally clear end state. And there was no plan. If you don't have a plan, you can't get to the goal. So, uh, and in fact, it was a, an absolute Keystone Cops operation there. If you want to see what a Keystone Cops operation was, you read Rajiv Chandrasekharan's book, uh, Imperial Life in the Emerald City, and then you will know. I mean, you know, these are adults doing these childish things. It was, of course, compounded by the disbandment of the Iraqi armed forces. Could there have been a stable plan if anyone had put a mind to it? A successful plan? So the idea of a stable American constitutional rule, rule of parties, elections, uh, Fair dealing, common goals. Um, in America, that's the result of centuries of historical experience together. How applicable to the different conditions of Iraq? Well, nobody ever asked the question. Um, in 1933, King Faisal had his own view. I will read it to you. Uh, Still no Iraqi people, but only unimaginable masses of human beings, devoid of any patriotic idea, imbued with religious traditions and absurdities, connected by no common tie and perpetually ready to rise against any government, whatever. I thought that was interesting. That's from the king, uh, the first king. So uh, we'll just talk briefly about Afghanistan. Again, the goal, American goal, just like us, democratic, stable, friendly, constitutional government. Uh, the concept is even more absurd than in Iraq. Um, so you can read a book. Uh, which is actually written by a friend of mine, Carter Malkaze, and he actually took the title from my book, War Comes to Long Island. Uh, so he was such an unusual person, and he was sort of effective. But he was only effective because he violated all the rules uh, and did things on his own. Um, and so, but if you just briefly look back at history, you look at the first Anglo-Afghan um, War, 1842. Uh, and entire British force of 18,000 men is wiped out. Every single one, except one person, the doctor, gets back. Everybody else is wiped out, 18,000 people. Uh, there's a famous book uh, by Warburton called um, 18 Years in the Khyber, I think it's called. And his, his, his wife was captured. Um, 
uh, or look at the Russian experience in Afghanistan. So there, in both Afghanistan and Iraq, there's no matching of the desired end state with the possibilities of what can be done. The nature society is completely different. So there's nothing profound about the failures, the reasons for the failures. They're easy to understand. It was just profound ignorance and profound uh, indifference. Uh, okay, so let's look at something completely different now, which is uh, corruption. So I became interested in corruption because uh, from living abroad most of my life in a very, very corrupt country. And it's just as corrupt now as it was when I first went there. And I became a victim of corruption. I was involved in um, litigation in this country for 26 years, so I learned a lot about it. And I became quite a well-known person in this issue, a matter. And so I was invited to be join the organizing committee for a 2005 uh, World Bank International Conference on Corruption in Thailand, and also to present a paper. Something bad is happening. Do you know? Jordan, save me from myself. It's <laughs> very sensitive. Okay. So go up another page. Yeah, okay, so that's it. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. So I don't use these things. I have an eye against the guy with a little red button on the computer. Okay, so. Uh, So, but this is an interesting question. It's corrupt, there are lots of anti-corruption programs, and it remains just as corrupt. So I thought that's an interesting scientific question. Um, I love these scientific questions. So I decided we'd do another case study. And so there's a famous incident of the Ministry of Public Health. And uh, in which there was a drug procurement scandal. And uh, the, so I decided we'll do that because all the evidence was available from the legal case which involved from me. So it turned out that it was not a case of bribes being uh, handed over you know, secretly in dirty gas station toilets. The, the minister had actually converted the ministry into a, a, an enormous criminal enterprise. Hundreds and hundreds of people working together. It was all organized uh, to, for payoffs for the uh, minister. The case bro broke due to an accident. Uh, and the courts uh, reluctantly uh, plowed ahead, and the minister was imprisoned, and it was a happy ending for law enforcement. Yes? No. Because a few years later, it was just as corrupt as it was before. Uh, so now, what was wrong with these internationally supported anti-corruption efforts? Well, again, it's uncorrected conceptual errors. Uh, so the first conceptual error was the use of the word corruption. It gets you off on the wrong foot right at the beginning. Uh, corruption implies a distortion of a system uh, from its intended noble purpose of serving the public. But for most of human history, on most of the globe, uh, that's not the purpose of involvement with public bodies. The purpose of involvement with public bodies is to enrich yourself and your family and your friends. That's true almost everywhere in the world, throughout almost all of history. And the second thing was an improper model of this ministry understood as a, uh, an assemblage of calculating humans. So uh, under the idea of the anti-corruptors, we will use negative incentives. We use the threat of imprisonment, improved uh, or stringent accounting procedures, and that will alter their behavior. It's considered to be a one-to-one -one relationship. We do something outside, and then the behavior changes inside. And in computer science, that's called a state machine. A state machine is a machine in which the, there's a fixed relationship between inputs and outputs, like your keyboard or on the scroll machine. It's always a fixed relationship by scroll, and, but well, this is a broken system. But real systems, that's the way state machines work. But um, in fact, the ministry restructured itself after these new things that were brought in after the first corruption case. People began to behave differently. And so uh, they reverted, they found new ways to revert to the norm of benefiting themselves and their friends and family. To be effective against corruption over the long term, and this is just one example of many human domains, you have to change behavioral norms. Your present day 
anti-corruption efforts. There's enormous amounts of money devoted to anti-corruption conferences, uh, consultancies, programs of all kinds. Uh, do they take any cognizance of this idea of changing behavioral norms? No. Uh, and that's why they continue to fail. As an amusement, I looked for historical examples of robust and long-lasting um, change in norms. And I wrote a second paper. And there are three examples. One of them I discussed with Paul. Uh, this is Lucurgus. So when he was king, the Spartans were a pretty rum bunch. Uh, and um, he wanted to improve them. So, uh, but he couldn't do that as king, he figured out. So he abdicated. And he had a plan. And he went back. He was actually invited back. And he turned the Spartans into the greatest military power on the peninsula for 400 years. Am I right on that, Paul? Or I get, yeah, more or less. Okay. For a long time, anyway. <laughs> um, okay. So then I looked at a second example of Mohammed. So the Arabs before Mohammed were more or less like the Spartans. Uh, you know, they're mainly interested in drinking and copulating and killing each other. And Mohammed had a divine vision. Uh, that he could do something about this and he could change them. And he had a plan and he did it. And the results are what we see today, 1400 years later. It was robust, durable behavioral change. And the third case is Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. So I was in Singapore in the 60s. It was a typical British colonial city. It was corrupt, it was dirty. Um, and Lee Kuan Yew came back from Cambridge University, had a plan, and he did something about this. And it's totally changed. Um, it's uh, now it's like an extremely well-run prison hospital. Everything is clean. Everybody has clean thoughts. Um, none of this started from political power or coercion. That's the key point. Uh, power came later. Uh, these three people created what I call what Peter Blau calls emergent structures. The same thing that happened in Vietnam. And is this part of any current doctrine of people involved in anti-corruption? No. The conceptual errors persist, so the problems persist. Okay, we'll do something completely different now, completely different area. Span. This thing else I'm really interested in. So I grew interested in this around 2003 when I was coding uh, some, uh, a web page for my website, and I discovered I couldn't use something called a mail to tag uh, because it would attract all the spam bots to harvest the email address. So spam was really bad in the early days of the internet. Uh, it's even worse now, and you have all kinds of new threats, and also you have telephone spam now. So I was puzzled. Um, we've solved other forms of pollution. Uh, why can't we solve the problem of spam? So I did some research on it. I wrote it up in an article, which is, should be here. I'm spinning like crazy here, Jordan, but nothing is happening to me. Do I have move to press the, the button? No, let's move, move, move the cursor up. Move the cursor. Yeah. yeah. No, no, okay. Now, now you can, uh, yeah. Okay. So, this is the magazine that appeared in. This is the first page of the article. It's called You Need and Need Span, or Worms. Um, and so, I analyzed the problem. Uh, basically, spammers work on the environmental polluter model. Each victim is injured too little to mount any kind of administrative or legal response. Uh, it's costless to create spam messages. And there are no consequences to pollution, and it's highly profitable. So, um, but the response which evolved Microsoft and people like that is um, to identify spam with an AI uh, system and then block it. And we'll look at, so here's a header from a message from Jordan to me, and this is all the anti-spam stuff at the head of the message. Um, and so often it's longer than the message, actually. If you click, look at headers, you'll see this stuff. This is all the coding. There's, there's a group, companies that got together, so okay, we will stop spam. Did it stop spam? No. It's even worse than ever, like the war in Iraq. It's a total failure. Um, Okay, so what worked? So that's, that's the other interesting question. So I studied that too. And it turns out that um, the reason that the anti-spam efforts fail, as evidenced by that, is they don't, they, the theory is we will accept the spam and we will block it. But this overlooks the most basic principle of human behavior, which is that actions 
have consequences than people who respond to consequences. And so I, I found two cases where a different model was used in which the companies that were the ISPs said, they set up an agreement among a large number of ISPs. If, you send, if your ISP sends spam to our ISP, we will block all communications. You've got to solve it. Essentially, it pushed the problem back on the creators of the spam. And it works instantly. In 24 hours, spam was over. They could not get enough effort behind that. Big companies, Microsoft, feel like that behind this kind of thing. But the point is, technical means exist to do this. The same thing for phone spam. It can be stopped in 24 hours. And there'll be some troubles during a transitional period. But technical solutions exist. But nobody's looking at the basic behavioral uh, nature of human beings, which is people respond to incentives. OK, so now let's look at the last case that I examined. Then we'll look at some common conclusions. So this is the 2007-2008 uh, economic crash, and also the one that's coming. Now. We're going to talk about that one, too. So let's see what I have here now. Yeah, it's actually two pages of headers, uh, all the so-called anti-spam stuff. Okay, we'll hold that for a second. Okay, so some basic concept about an economy, because one of the things I've always tried to do in my career is to look at the big picture, the external linkages, which is not what I was taught when I studied economics um, at Harvard uh, 50 years ago. It's not what my daughter Jasmine was taught by Ellen Blinder at uh, Princeton uh, a few years ago. So the economy is a system. It's embedded in a larger system of social relationships. Um, communities or societies are stable because they embody some homeostatic processes which keep important variables within expected ranges. For example, in the economy, interest rates, savings rates, consumption, government spending, things like that. And the homeostatic processes work by a mechanism which in electrical engineering is called feedback. Uh, it goes back to a century. It was discovered in the early days of radio with something called a superheterodyne receiver. The first paper was written about a superheterodyne receiver. Um, and there are two kinds. There's positive and negative in engineering terms, but for social science work, I don't use those terms because some people might consider them pejorative. I use the terms uh, regenerative and corrective. So corrective feedback forces the system back toward its goal, and regenerative feedback forces it away from its goal. Okay, so second basic concept is about wealth and income. So wealth is saved income, it's a stock resulting from flow, either physically or from in more advanced uh, economies from um, uh, financial assets. And income comes from production. And higher income comes from a different ratio between outputs and inputs, which is known as productivity. And human wants are unlimited. Uh, and that's a very important driver in the external political system in which the economic system and the social system are embedded. Okay, so now the third thing is the level of economic activity, affected by many factors, external and internal, uh, to the economy. One is willingness to spend and confidence of individuals and businesses. It can be either consumption or investment. And for the resulting level of spending, either consumption or investment, doesn't suffice to satisfy the public clamor um, for more uh, unlimited wants, um, and that threatens those in power. They will search for a quick fix. Now remember, the only long-term fix is increasing productivity, but that doesn't solve the politicians' problems. So their solution is to um, create claims and then distribute them to the people who are causing trouble. And it can be real money, paper, you know, they might you know, print hundred bills, hundred dollar bills and drop them from helicopters, or it can be bank credit. And this will alter spending behavior. And so this was the idea that Keynes had. This was Keynes in the 1930s now. Um, but he was smart enough to realize that this process of modulating consumption uh, with the availability of claims dollar bills or pound sterling or bank credit was cyclical. So you have to claw back what you create at a later point in the cycle. That's in his work. Uh, what we have now 
Now, what I was taught by Otto Eckstein in 1962, but what's taught now by Alan Blinder at uh, Princeton, I'm at Harvard by um, uh, Larry Summers, is uh, what I call degenerate Keynesianism, uh, which is that, and it has a new rule, not that you modulate uh, spending by altering interest rates around a mean, but that whenever anybody feels distressed, you create claims so that they don't feel the distress anymore. And there's no need to claw back what you create. It's a one-way ratchet. And also, it encompasses something called a 2% now, called a 2% inflation goal. And this ultimately results... Okay, so you have lots of instabilities in systems all the time, and you have something which is called the avalanche effect. And eventually, this system, I can't get into the details now, um, Essentially, an enormous pile of sand can be collapsed by dropping one last grain of sand on the top when it's in avalanche condition. So the result is that uh, so-called income and growth produced under the new doctrine of degenerate Keynesianism is actually decapitalization. Uh, and I call it occult decapitalization because you don't feel it as you go along. So now there's an important historical fact, which is that all periods of economic stability are followed by economic crisis. It's an inevitable thing, and it's always been true. And in, this, in the crisis, the occult decapitalization becomes manifest decapitalization as asset values collapse, and the owners are wiped out. And it's in this way that the consumption, which the beneficiaries didn't earn, uh, is paid for by the people who are ruined. Uh, in the crash. But the great benefit of this system is that no one is responsible. The music just stops and whoever doesn't have a chair um, is ruined. Uh, so it's not like in the old days where there were, uh, a sentence, so th there was a, 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 a corrective process, negative feedback. If you had too much debt, you borrowed too much money, you went and had too many restaurant meals, your bank would say, I'm not going to give you an increase in your credit. And you say, well, I'm going to go bankrupt. You could not make some money. And they say, well, that's too bad. You've made bad decisions. Nobody makes that uh, choice anymore. So this results in cumulative and exponential changes in variables when the feedback loop uh, is open. So in electrical engineering, we call them open feedback loop. There's no corrective feedback mechanism. And so I design, um, among other things, um, telecommunications power supplies. Here's one that I designed. So it's a little brick. It's got two input terminals. You put 24 volts in. I got two output terminals. You get 86 volts AC out for a particular use in telecommunications. And when I, if you design it wrong, um, then uh, it begins to get hot, and then there are flames, and it explodes. Uh, and this happened to me last week. I designed a new product and I took the prototype out to the customer. I said, watch this, and we hooked it up, and it blew up right in front of us. Very dramatic. <laughs> but you see, but there's a corrective process, you know. I couldn't sell that. I had to go back to the drawing board, so it's being redesigned now. I told them how to redesign it. Um, so, but what happens in the economy is this. So you look at interest rates. So this is a very interesting diagram I saw. I don't have the original source, but it's validated from many sources. Uh, interest rates over 5,000 years. And so this is what's called a hockey stick formation. A hockey stick formation occurs when you get an open feedback loop. There's no corrective mechanism. So uh, interest rates used to be rather high in Mesopotamia, and then they're sort of stable for a long time, and then they just drop to zero. So that's a hockey stick. I'll give you another example of a hockey stick formation. There's another one. That's the Fed's balance sheet. So, and I'll give you another really interesting one. <laughs> There's carbon dioxide levels. Okay, so when you see a hockey stick formation, you know that's an open loop. And open loops always end in disaster. Like my power supply blowing up. I've blown up many power supplies. But in engineering, you're taught you can't allow for open loops. Uh, well, there are rare engineering circumstances where you can use open loops, but mostly you can't. You have to close the loop, the feedback loop. So degenerate Keynesianism opens the feedback loop in the economy. And so it hasn't happened yet, but the inference is 
something very, very bad is going to happen. Um, now, are these conceptions part of the framing of economic policy, such as you would see in uh, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the New York Times, uh, papers published by the National Bureau of Economic Research, reports from the Fed? No, these concepts are never mentioned. And if you try to talk to an economist about that, I try to talk to Larry Summers about it, they will not discuss it with you. It is just, nobody will talk about these things. Okay, so let's look at uh, some varies. We'll hold that for a moment. Okay, so if a plane crashes, we examine the facts and we know why uh, how to design the plane, uh, planes better, or to assign personal responsibility. And if a bridge falls down, we do the same. We almost always learn the answers to questions unless there's no physical evidence, like Malaysian Airlines Flight like, uh, 370. If you ask a panel of economists, 10 economists, they're sitting around the table here, uh, let's come to some conclusions about the 2007 economic crash. They will start quarreling and they will never come to a conclusion by the time they close the building. Uh, 50 years later, people are still arguing about the Vietnam War. Books are still being published with personal animosities behind them, uh, all looking at the same evidence. Uh, and the big guns are still disputing the Iraq mess. And if you don't believe me, you should view a film called The Unknown Known. And you will see, you know, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling. They're still arguing about these things. Uh, so it's unprofessional. It's unscientific. Uh, in medicine, if I am right, it's called quackery. Uh, you're a quack if you just don't use science. You just Whatever comes into your mind, you do it to the patient. And the same thing is being done by the political leadership of the United States. Not Republicans, not Democrats, even apolitical people. They have no conception of how to scientifically analyze these problems. So it's easy to fix, and here it is. Uh, so these clever, well-educated social scientists, so-called social scientists, social so-called scientists, actually, I want to call them, um, they had good intentions, but no idea how to specify reliable scientific models. And they have little idea to do what to do when they have bad models. Uh, social scientists with the ear of decision makers, uh, proffer and accept uh, simplistic thinking. Vietnam, uh, bombing failed, we use more bombs. Uh, economy, printing paper claims to wealth uh, doesn't make people wealthy. Okay, print poor, make more paper claims. Um, during my Kennedy School uh, fellowship, I discovered a remarkable uh, fact. I audited all the classes on policy. And they tell you they're very good how to create an excellent policy, design proper amendment programs, perfectly execute, how to uh, monitor implementation. But nowhere in any curriculum or syllabus did they say, how do I teach you? How do I avoid making a decision tending to catastrophic consequences? It's a completely different subject, and nobody's teaching. So this is where we get deadly results. Now, I've developed some rules from the case studies, and there's no direct line between the case studies and the, the filters which I come up, uh, but it's just a way to stimulate my creativity. I should say I have a parallel career in electrical engineering. Um, I design telecommunications devices. Electrical engineering is a wonderful discipline because it forces you into clear thinking. Um, if you design it wrong, it blows up. And I did it last week. And uh, you have to go back to the drawing board. So, uh, just to make a little example, you know, here's a black box. This is, you know, the, the idea of a black box. And so, I put a bulb on it and a knob, and inside this black box there's a mechanism. I turn the knob, and at some point, the bulb goes on. And it's the same for societies. You have to have a model. If you don't have an accurate model, uh, then uh, you can't plan. Stop if you don't have an accurate model. Okay, so let's look at uh, so my idea is we develop a set of filters, which are rules. If things are ambiguous, you always go to the rule. 
uh, no, in engineering, no. we have Ohm's law. You know, why is that resistor heating up? Well, I go, I do the computations from Ohm's law. Then, oh, it's getting two watts. It's only rated a half a watt, but I've got six watts of dissipation. That's why it burned up. And the same thing in social life. You have to go to rules. You have to have firm rules that you always follow. And uh, so let's look at some of these rules now. So I'm going to just walk through these. Uh, these pages were taken from another presentation I gave five years ago, which Parker and uh, Maureen saw at my 50th college reunion. So here we go. So. Method of scientific choice to specify a piece of reality, identify your goals, identify the input output relationships, and then you have to craft the programs so that the inputs produce the outputs you desire. And the properly specified input output model has at least these properties. This is important. It specifies the entire range of inputs affecting the output, defines each IO relationship directionally, if possible, numerically. The specifications have to handle step functions and discontinuities. You have to state the assumptions and the boundary and limiting conditions. And you have to know whether the black box is a state machine or an intelligent machine. And you have to identify the feedback paths and the resonances for their effect on the system stability. That's what you do for a power supply. That's what you have to do for public policy making or any kind of policy making. So let's look through some of the filters that I came up. So here are the first two. These are very old. This is nothing I dreamed of. These are ancient wisdom. That's why they're very These are things which are always true. You have to see reality as it really is. This is the basic insight of Buddhism. There it is in power. It's the most important rule of all the 12 rules. And the second most important rule is do no harm, which means if you don't know what you're doing, don't do anything. The patient may recover, but even if the patient doesn't recover, you won't have injured him. As happened in Vietnam. The United States government destroyed Vietnam because it didn't understand the model. The variety of wealth. Wealth only comes from these things. Change in the production function. I talked about the Haber-Bosch process, production method, interchangeable parts, and Ford, business process, division of labor, Transport and communication reduce delivery costs, fall on the internet, market expansion reduces the cost of the, in, uh, the EU, and labor availability and effectiveness. So that's uh, the human capital. Those are the only things that more wealth comes from in the long term. Reversion toward the mean. So system values have an expected range, and they always are going to revert toward their mean if you don't open the feedback the variety of action and consequence forces things to stay within their normal range. The absence of negative feedback, what I call corrective feedback, permits an unguided system which will diverge from the goals. And that was the case of the Fed balance sheet uh, and the interest rate. So that's a case of an open loop. They always end in catastrophe. So the variety of time. All cyclic processes, by definition, have a cycle time, which has a range of expected values. The statement X is true is only going to be valid, valid over a relevant time period. You have to ask yourself, what's the relevant time period? I'll give you a, a funny example in a moment. And the variety of prior end state specification. Before you start, you have to know the end state. Principle conformity. You have to conform to the model. Reliability, this is for reliability engineering. You have to design in principles from safety and reliability engineering. Reserve capacity, loose coupling, no single point of failure, graceful degradation. If you ask anybody at the National Security Council, what's your uh, reliability mechanism? What are the reliability mechanisms you built in? They wouldn't even know what you were talking about. They never read a book on safety engineering. Legal claims, okay, this is sort of a technical point. Um, tangible objects of value are the only currency that's not a liability. 
fiat currency, there's always somebody else applying to it, and you can create it. You have to have a plan for it. What's going to happen to it until extinction? Rarity of truth rules. Negative feedback can't operate without accurate communication. So if people are lying to each other, then this thing is going to go bad because you're going to have open feedback. So here's like some examples. So here we go. Very, you're seeing reality is really good. So here's Alan Greenspan in his 2006 crash of not likely, or the failed anti corruption industry. Go on now, view society as a state machine. So it's a total failure. Very, well, okay, Bernard Bernanke, wealth is created by printing paper. Jack Lou, remember him, Secretary of the Treasury? He says, the driver for economic growth will be consumer demand. So in the short term, it may be true, well, it's not true now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, it's nonsense. You know, these people are just spouting nonsense. Nobody's calling them. Uh, they already reversed toward the mean, 2000 had a housing market. You know, it was a, it was a mathematical impossibility that the, the business models of many, many companies could continue. Um, OK, so for designing for action and consequence, these always have to be engineered in. They have to be specific. Time periods, the lags, the sensitivity, what are the couplings, and the meaningfulness of the feedback to the actor. Okay, so here's Paul Krugman, the very plan. He keeps saying, oh, look, there's no inflation. We can keep printing more money. But if he never mentions the cycle, never talks about it. If you asked about it, he would refuse to engage in that conversation. Uh, Alan Blinder told my daughter Jasmine, everybody in her class, borrow as much money as you can. Because you will always have a lot of money. That's what he told her. So he has no concession of this idea of the cyclic processes involved. Uh, okay, so there are a few. Uh, yeah, okay, so very truth, right we're in chain. You know, they're just constant lying inside the system. Okay, so I've said enough about the verities. These are all pretty. Um, Simple things to understand. They go back a long time in human history. Basically, everybody understands these things. They're just not being executed. And I can tell you that um, the executive branch of the United States government will never accept these concepts. And I'll give you some examples. In 1970, so I wrote an article in 1970 called How They Won, which was how the communists had won. The war wasn't over yet, but I wrote this article. And as a result of this article, I was just a graduate student. I was invited by the Defense Department to join a seminar on lessons learned in Vietnam about what was what we can do to do better. So it was very nice. They flew me down to Blue Ridge Mountains, rental car, went there, people from a lot of different agencies, AID, state, CIA, uh, National Security Council. And so maybe 30 people, the discussion was very interesting, so it was worthwhile. Uh, at one point on the second day, they were talking about something I knew a lot about. I raised my hand, I said, um, the, way this, the way you're analyzing the problem is not going to work well for you. It's not working well for you, but there's another way to analyze it that will work for you. And I started to explain it, and uh, Dr. Chester Cooper was the head of the thing, and he said, Mr. Race, please sit down. We cannot tell them this at the Pentagon. We will not have any discussion of this subject. So I didn't sit down. I picked up my papers and put them in my briefcase and walked to my room, got my clothes, got my rental car, went back to the airport and flew back to Boston. I wrote my book, They Lost the War. Um, Caldwell's book. So this is quite an important book. It even has an endorsement from General McMaster on the back. So I've been a member of the Army Navy Club for 50 years, and every week they have a book discussion about some important subject. And they invite the author, and then they announce it, and people come to discuss the subject. So I nominated John's book. You know, we should really have a discussion about this. It's very important, the future of America. Um, so they declined. They said it doesn't fit their program to, uh, at the Army Navy Club. <coughs> so the situation is no better now than it was in 1970. Okay. Um, so I've been pondering these issues, and I've lived them for 50 years. I'm 76 now. Uh, 
I think I've done my part, at least I will when the book comes out. Uh, I think it's now up to you in the audience how to carry forward on this thing. I've done uh, what I can do. Um, I'm finished now. If you have questions, I'd be delighted to respond to them. Uh, some years ago, I think it was Stephen Cole, but it might have been Nick Lamont in New Yorker, well, Nick Lemon, sorry, uh, writing about the, um, the transparency of some of the decision making going into the Iraq war. If only there had been something like the Pentagon Papers to warn us, uh, we would not have made that terrible mistake. Uh, and then he answered his own supposition and said, that's not, that's the wrong lesson always indicators, we just ignore them. So what are the indicators that are being ignored right now besides the hockey stick draft and things like that? Okay, let me go back and mention one thing first, which I should have stated, but I didn't. Maybe it was a too small type of my notes. The executive branch of the United States government will never accept these ideas. Never accept these Except any of these ideas, that we have to modify our planning and programming processes to ask us all these questions. It's a checklist. It's like doctors, you know. Yeah. Is the patient's leg mark that you're going to cut off? They will never agree to these things. My own personal experience in the it. It'll have to be forced on them by some, there'll have to be an external body set up. So we have the GAO. And that does it sort of for phony accounting, um, and which really got out of hand before it was set up. And something like that has to be set up to enforce the use of these filters on the making of public policy. You can't depend, okay, so Dan Ellsberg, that was a very courageous thing he did. There are not a lot of people like Dan Ellsberg who would do the kind of things he does. And there are too many problems anyway. It has to be built in to the part of the process. So the indicator, I say, what are the indicators? So I would say in the economic sense, on the, you know, the, the economic, economists talking heads are talking nonsense. So that just has to be held up against reality. They have to be questioned on this. There has to be a mechanism to do that. There's no mechanism there. The system cannot reform itself. It has to be from outside. And so but there are many, many indicators. You know, I just, I, I, you know, I, read, I read many newspapers every year. I read, many, read a lot of stuff from NDER. Technically, this stuff is very good. But in terms of the understanding of the place of the economy in the larger system, they just talk nonsense. And then they get into personal, I mean, this conversation I had with Larry Summers, you know, he just gets into personal vilification. And it's just not, it's the way the discourse goes. That has to, we have to go back to science and evidence. And the system will not reform itself. So in terms of, you know, the wars, you know, we're sending people back, uh, again, the countries we said we're gonna get out of. Uh, the thing has never been analyzed scientifically. Okay, so Carter is inside. He was the special advisor of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We don't see much of him. He's working very hard. But he's just one little person inside a big... I've been, been in the system. I spent 28 years in the Army. Uh, if we back in the reserves, I worked on some big projects. Nobody asks questions like this. These. It has to be built in. Yes, sir. Well... I don't know what to think of this. It's also over my head. But it seems to me that you are trying to apply science to a human environment, and you've met nothing but brick walls all the 50 years. Have you ever tried to look at how DNA, I like to watch forensic files and all these other uh, scientific uh, solutions to criminal behavior. It had to start somewhere. Where did, do you think that the DNA revolution in criminology has any applicability to your model? I mean, they had to, you know, sometimes they were just as far off as you have said, and I think quite correctly, the scissor makers are. How do you get, how do you penetrate to the scientific capability to turn this whole thing around? Because it seems like, what's that? Uh, example of the guy climbing up the hill with the rock on this. This would be Sisyphus. Yeah, it seems like you're, you're just going to keep falling back, falling back. How the hell do you ever get a single evidence, a piece of thing, that would, would, would show, either in this 
war or an impeachment or whatever that would get you off this uh, dead end, it seems. Is there any, do you have any, are you optimistic about it or what do you think can be done? Well, in terms of the DNA, the way, you, so the, the, the specific question there, if I understand it correctly, is how was the use of DNA evidence accepted in the legal system as scientifically valid? And that question has an answer, and the answer I believe is that people had important personal interests in that. Either they were prosecutors or there were people trying to get um, criminal charges dismissed, and the science was very important, and they individually pushed, and but they were pushing against an open door because they were pushing again in the court system. The court system is based on, legal systems everywhere are based on reasoning and evidence. There's no objection. This kind of thing would produce enormous resistance. My little small attempts have completely failed because current, the current method is the lazy way to do things. There are no consequences. As I put in the blurb, everything is squishy. There are no wrong answers. Oh, yeah, okay. We lost 10,000 men on that. Too bad. Maybe we'll do better next time. Why? Well, I don't know. We'll just try it again. See what happens. This is the way. This is the level of thinking. You think about sending Paul Bremer to Iraq, and he has the eye. He just dream, wakes up in the morning. He's going to disband the Iraqi army. Now, just, it's just complete. I don't know how to describe it, but it's not science, and it's not based on evidence, and that's what has to stop. It, it was science, actually, but the constant consequences were ignored. I mean, science means that you you observe the empirical results of your actions and correct according to what you find. And I think in current uh, classical economics and uh, much of government, you don't see that uh, that happening. No, there's, so there's not the process, you know, to, I, so the, the term they use in the Army is learning organization. That was very big for General Petraeus to become a learning organization. That's one of the reasons they were able to do the things but to a limited extent they were when he went back with McMaster. Um, so, uh, but they're not, they're not learning. It's getting worse. I mean, look at Cain. So he had some interesting ideas. Now it's degenerate Cain again. No, I'm not optimistic. Yes, sir. Sound like Last question, please. You sound like a proponent of feedback loops, the MIT theory of understanding and adjusting. And you, you were asked the question about how do we implement this type of analysis and reaction. And you said people react to incentives. So what type of incentives do we need to have? Because the only incentive that seems to be at the Political leadership of election incentives, which, as you say, has no, to be I'll cut you off because we're running out of time. That's not going to work. The incentive that has to be applied is an incentive that applies if you poorly design a bridge. You think of this bridge in the hotel where it's out in the Midwest, you know, they're on it, it resonates, it collapses. They went back to find the person, the engineer who designed it. There's a signature on a piece of paper. I think his professional organization discipline, maybe he went to prison. That happens, you know. The Romans, if you built a bridge, the architect had to be under the bridge when they took out the struts. That was their feedback loop. People have to go to prison for bad decisions. Everything has to be documented. You have to say, okay, this is a policy for you know, a war or some other, a law. You have to ask yourself all these questions. It's not now that people are asking the questions and getting the wrong answers. They are not asking the questions. That has to be put into law, I think. There have to be external audit organizations for government decision making. And if bad decisions, which are negligent through failure to follow rules of science, producing deaths, people have to be personally accountable. There is no personal accountability now. The elections are not going to work for this kind of thing. Okay, thank you very much.